Back in February, I made a string of videos on picture profiles, LUTs, and grading tips for the Sony cameras, and while the reception of those videos was excellent, many of you did express some concerns dealing with noise, especially with HLG. So today we're going to talk about reducing the noise in your images, and hopefully apply this to other profiles and cameras as well. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone and I'm up all night to get lucky. So I recommended HLG in those previous videos as a gamma that gives you a pretty good balance between dynamic range, pleasing color, and a relatively easy workflow. But based on your comments, it seems that many of you are having issues dealing with noise when using that profile, and after some further testing, I think I might have figured out why that is. I tried testing the same profiles that I tested before, but this time underexposed, and sure enough, HLG produced more noise than any of the Cine gammas or even S-Log2 when underexposed. So the solution there is to never underexpose HLG, and in fact, overexposing a little bit is probably best, and that goes for most of these gammas. So let's take a look at how far you should overexpose the different gammas, as well as how to reliably evaluate that exposure while shooting. But before we get into that, if you've already botched the exposure on a shot and there's no going back, then perhaps a clip or two from today's sponsor Storyblocks could come in handy. Storyblocks is an impressive collection of stock footage covering a wide range of subjects with unlimited downloads and 4K footage. The interface is easy to use and navigate, and the clips are royalty free for both personal and commercial use, so you can use them as much as you want, wherever you want. So if you think you could take advantage of a fantastic library of quality stock footage and effects, check out Storyblocks using the link in the description below. Alright, so I've set up a control shot so that I can show you how to dial in that overexposure, but the camera configuration in order to be able to capture this is pretty funny. So many clamps and arms everywhere. I posted about this to Instagram in my story, which you would have already seen if you were following me. But anyway, there's three tools that are going to make this possible. You can either use zebras, waveforms, or false color. If you're shooting on a hybrid camera and don't have a separate monitor, you'll probably only have access to zebras, so we'll definitely focus on them. But I do highly encourage you getting a monitor like the Ninja 5, which also has an external recorder, which is excellent when paired with the Sony's, not only because of the extra tools for exposure, but it'll also be easier to edit your files using those codecs like ProRes and DNX. Alright, so this, as it stands right now, is a balanced exposure, meaning that we've exposed to the middle. I'm using the standard HLG with the BT2020 color, and we've put our middle gray at around 50% on the exposure scale. That's exposed to the middle. This is not underexposed by any means, and will usually produce pretty great results if the image doesn't need to be pushed very much in either direction in post. So let's look at how we can achieve this exposure using the three tools that I mentioned. So first up, let's look at zebras, which right now are positioned on the Sony screen. So you see how there's the stripe patterns on the middle gray? That means that our middle gray, or at least that section of our middle gray piece on the color checker is at about 50%. Now let's jump over here to the Ninja 5 and we'll turn on false color. Now false color also provides an exposure reading and it's based on this legend on the side. I don't know how well you can see that, but basically the colors range from like purple through blue, then gray, then green is right in the middle. And that starts going up from there, a lighter gray color and then yellowy orange and then red when you're really overexposed. So if we want something to be at like 50%, then we want it to turn that green color. And we can already see on false color that we're getting a little bit of green down here on the middle gray. And the rest of the middle gray is just a little bit less exposed than that. So if we want that to match our zebras, then we can determine, I guess, how the zebras are set for that particular picture profile. So we can just come down here and change our zebra reading by going down until, I would say about 48, 47, 46, we'll say 47. 47 has a pretty similar result to false color, so that's going to be exposed in the middle using 47 zebras for HLG, or we can use false color over here. And the other option that we have is with waveforms that I mentioned, that's our third tool. So here we can see that our middle gray bar is reaching right about 50%. So those are your three different ways of confirming exposure, or in this case, confirming that you're exposed to the middle. Now I'm just gonna record a small sample of this one so that we can come back to it later on and we'll refer to this as middle exposure when we evaluate these in post for comparison. Now let's underexpose the image by bringing it down two stops. So I'm gonna bring it all the way down with ISO, so that's one stop. And we can't quite go down two stops because the lowest it goes is ISO 125, but we can stop it down just a notch with aperture to make that. So we have two stops down now. So we're at F2.2 at ISO 125. And now we can see that our middle gray is way down here, probably at like 28, 30%, somewhere around there. And that is grossly underexposed for HLG. And if we take a look at what that looks like with the false color on, well, you can see that most of the image now is blue and dark, and that means we're not, we're not doing well here. So let's do a quick recording of that. So again, we can compare it in post later on. 
Now, at first glance, you might think that this would produce less noise because we've lowered our ISO, and I think that could be potentially where some of the people that commented were going wrong, because even though, yes, our ISO is all the way down to the base, when you correct for this in post, which will require quite a bit of boosting the signal, you're going to bring all that noise back, plus you're going to introduce other problems like color shifting and some weird artifacts. Now let's shoot an overexposed version as well to compare, but the trick here is how far to overexpose, and there's a few factors that you need to consider when doing this. So first you have to consider the capabilities of the profile that you're using, because some will have a lower maximum output level than 100%. For instance, with HLG1 and 2, they're lower than HLG and HLG3. Both HLG and HLG3, the maximum output level is set to 100%, but HLG1 is set all the way down to 87%, and HLG2 at 95%. And these would be reflected in the waveform, if I bring that up here. Your whitest point, so if we increased the ISO all the way up, do you see how once it gets to 100, then the line becomes flat across. That means it's like clipped beyond that. There's no longer any detail in there. Well, that straight flat line would occur lower with HLG1 and HLG2. That's how the maximum output level is affected. But the curve also matters too, because S-Log2, for instance, which has a 106% maximum output, actually can retain a lot more in the highlights and has more overexposure potential compared to Cine1, which has a maximum higher output level of 109%, because it's more important the curve there of S-Log versus Cine1 than it is just their maximum output level. Now you can see this in action just by counting your stops while watching your waveforms or your zebras, but it's important to know the clipping point of each profile, otherwise you won't know how to set your zebras. Now luckily, most of the manufacturers include the clipping point in their manuals, and often, if you don't really know a safe one, is usually probably 100%, unless you're using a specific profile, like the shorter ones, like I was talking about HLG1 and HLG2, or like V-Log for Panasonic or S-Log3, they all have lower than 100%, but if you're using more standard gamma, 100% is probably the safe one. But even if it is 100% like HLG, you should probably still set your zebras lower than that. So we're gonna set our lower limit here to 95 plus. The reason why we wanna give ourselves that extra bit of buffer is because just because the clipping point is 100 doesn't mean that all of the individual color channels are going to come in at the same potency. And so you may have a white image that isn't clipped, but the red channel might be clipped a little bit, or the blue channel. So it's safer to give yourself that extra 5 to 7% buffer, so that even if the white's coming in at 95, maybe the red is coming in at 99, but it's still all safe. It's still all under that 100%. So now that we've set our zebras, which we set them to 95, as we can see here, and we'll leave the waveforms up on this other screen, as we increase our exposure using ISO, eventually the zebras start to creep in, and we can see them there on the white. And now if we look over here on the waveforms, we can see that we're just almost touching the 100. We're not up to 100 all the way because we set them to 95, so we have a little bit of that safety there. And if we compare this instead to our false color, take the waveforms off, we can see that the yellow is now starting to turn into that orange and red. Now let's overexpose it clearly, and you can see how this white bar here turned completely red. And if we look over here at our zebras on this screen, we definitely have them in several places on our image, so this would be overexposed. So we're going to bring this down. You might be able to get away with this because there's only that little touch there and we do have it at 95 so we're probably safe But if you really wanted to be safe you could bring it down one notch further and that has to do with preserving details So even though you are still maybe in that safe range Sometimes it's better to come down one more notch because as you squeeze the highlights usually with these curves there's more more information sort of crammed into the top end so as you sort of cram all that information into the top part of the curve on the highlights you're gonna leave less space to actually pull that detail out when you bring the image down. So it's usually smarter, save yourself a little bit of space for the clipping, and then save yourself maybe one more notch to preserve highlight detail. If you have no interest in the highlights, like in this shot there's a black background, but let's say that it was some already impossible sky, well then I guess it doesn't really matter. But if it was an image where you were trying to expose a little bit with those clouds, well then there will be a difference between that one notch or the extra notch because you might lose a little bit of the detail on the fluff in the cloud if you went up. So. Bring it down one more notch from there. So for HLG, a safe point here for overexposure from the middle. We'll talk more about overexposing based on manuals, but we're talking about from the middle. Yeah, we have a good middle exposure here at 400 or even, even 320, 320 to 400. And now we can safely overexpose up to 640 and probably 800 would be okay for most purposes, but if you wanted to be safe and still have a little bit of overexposure, we'll say 640 is the safe one. So that's two thirds to one full stop 
over exposing to the middle. And this whole process is what's known as exposing to the right. But there's different interpretations of that. Some people believe it means, you know, jamming your histogram all the way to the right. Other people believe that it's moving it to the right but still allowing for roll off. This is the way that I expose to the right. It's not all the way to the right, but it's as far as to the right as I feel comfortable with when it comes to trying to preserve most of the image but still, you know, working in a decent amount of noise reduction. Now, the other thing you need to consider when you do this is your subject. In this case, our subject is this color chart. So we're obviously overexposing correctly. But like I mentioned before, in that other scenario where maybe your background was a sky and maybe the sky is important, you have to ask yourself what the subject is. If it's, you wanna have our color chart, let's call that sort of our secondary subject. If that's supposed to be kind of in the foreground and you're supposed to know that it's there, but what's really important is the sense of what the sky means to that scene or, you know, they're looking looking up at the sky or something, then you maybe don't want to use this based on the chart, you would want to use this based on the sky. So you'd want to do this, you know, expose the sky until there's zebras, then come back down and then maybe come down one more if detail is important to you. And then maybe when you look down at the chart, you found that it's quite dark. That's okay because you're going to leave that chart dark. What you don't want to do and what I see happen a lot is that people will do that thing where they expose for the sky, they retain the sky, but then they also bump the shadows to make the chart also be naturally exposed and that's not really possible you'd have to light the chart to increase the exposure on it i'm talking like a like a unified light experience like just a sky or a natural light environment you wouldn't be able to expose both of those things so you shouldn't bump the shadows because now your chart is going to be really really noisy because you exposed for the sky you would have to light the chart and increase the exposure on it until it followed the same ettr principles that we're discussing in both scenes if the two elements have different exposures, you can't ETTR to both of them successfully at the same time. So then your other option, which you'll see a lot in films, is that the subject will just be exposed for, and they just let the skies blow out, because who cares about the skies? We're looking at the expression on the person's face in that war scene or whatever. But anyway, there's just two different things to keep in mind. Make sure that you're applying these principles to what is important to you in the frame, not two things and not the wrong thing. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a cheat guide here, because it's quite possible that you're not going to be able to do all this every time you want to set up a run and gun shot. If you have the ability to set up a complete exposure situation like this with a monitor and the correct tools and a color chart and everything, I would recommend that you do it. But if you're running around, you're just trying to shoot some subjects of skin, I'm going to give you a couple percentages to target here so that maybe it can make your life easier just with zebras. So if we look at the color chart over here, we've got our different skin chips and they range from very fair skin to darker skin. So based on whatever subject you're shooting, I'm going to give you some percentages so that you can get a rough idea of where to put their skin since they're likely your subject, in order to get the correct overexposure. So to do that, we're gonna go into our zebras and we're gonna change our standard range and we can dial this in to whatever skin tone that we want, to whatever exposure that we want. But first, let's see what the different skin tones are by just increasing our zebras until we see where things are placed. So let's go all the way up here to, until we get to the top chip. So there, 78. You see, usually people try to remove the zebras because it's an indicator of overexposure and you want to remove anything that's overexposed. But you can also use it when it's your only tool, as in the case of the Sony mirrorless cameras, you can use it as a tell me the exposure of that subject. So right now, our subject, the top chip is 78%. So if we set this at 78% and then we ran around and filmed our subjects and they had similar skin tone, when we saw zebras on their face, we would know that we would have them at 78% and that might be what we're looking for. So I'm gonna go through and show you the different percentages for each one. So that's 78 for that top chip. Now we'll move down. It's about 76 for the one below it. And then we'll move down and that one there is showing up at 70%. So hopefully that'll give you a little bit of a cheat guide to know roughly where to set the exposure for those different skin types. And then once you have that, you can switch to your second zebras down here, which are set to 95%, just to make sure that nothing is clipped. Now these percentages only apply to HLG or HLG3. They're both pretty much exactly the same. Like I said, I wouldn't monkey around with HLG1 and 2 unless you want to completely change that whole workflow. And with HLG and HLG3, it doesn't really matter. They're interchangeable. Just one is more saturated than the other. But before we move on to the other profiles where I'll give you the exact same sort of cheat guide, I wanna talk a little bit about other ways to affect the noise in your image. Firstly, as I've recommended with all the profiles is to set your detail in the camera down to minus seven. This will remove any sharpening that's applied to your image because usually when you apply sharpening, you also roughen up the edges of your noise and makes it more noticeable. But some of you seem to still wanna apply some sharpening and that's okay, I guess. I don't recommend it. I think you should always do sharpening in post. But if you need to sharpen your image, here in camera, there's another option under adjust 
called crispening. And what this does is affect, it's sort of like a tolerance level. The higher you set it, the more contrast is required in order for the sharpening to even be applied. It, it affects the way that the luma is, like the luma changes between two areas. If we were to change this mode to manual so that we can adjust it and then go down here and increase the crispening. So at zero, it's willing to apply the detail changes, the sharpening to a much wider range of elements in your frame. But if we increase the crispening all the way up to seven, well now it's only going to apply that sharpening, the detail settings, to the, the most severe changes in luma. So this shouldn't affect noise that much because noise is generally you know, not very contrasty. It's pretty, like, pretty even when it comes to luma. So if you have your crispening high, then you can probably still have some sharpening in your image without worrying about it affecting your noise. But if you have your detail set to minus seven, then this doesn't really matter because there's not really any sharpening being applied anyway, but just something that you should know. All right, now let's blast through the other gammas and make some determinations about their overexposure potential. Because the greater the overexposure potential of a gamma, the greater the noise suppression potential of that gamma as well. Because in post, when you bring your image back down, you push the noise down with it. So the winner here is definitely gonna be S-Log2. Now, S-Log3 is another great example, but I don't really recommend using that on these mirrorless cameras because the codex in them is not really built for S-Log3, that's more for cinema cameras. So with what we've got to work with here, S-Log2 is probably the best bet for overexposure potential. And it works pretty much the same way. So first let's go ahead and achieve that middle exposure. Now like I pointed out earlier, I've already found that around 45 on the zebras is about the same as false color and waveforms. And if we put our waveforms on, we can see that, yeah, it's pretty much around the middle there for middle gray. Now, it gets more complicated than that when it comes to S-Log. And that's because, remember how I said you should check your manual so you know what your maximum output level is for your different gammas? Well, if you do that for Sony, it will tell you that when it comes to exposing S-Log 2, if you want the maximum dynamic range, that you should set middle gray to 32%. This will give you the most dynamic range but it doesn't exactly give you the best image. And other people have covered this in depth already. Wolf Crow has a whole guide on it. Alistair Chapman's talked about it many times. But it's important to know this because when those guides and when other people talk about overexposing S-Log, they're usually talking about overexposing from that 32% point, not from exposing to the middle. So if somebody said, oh, I've overexposed two stops on S-Log, two stops after achieving that 32% is usually what they mean. So let's start by putting S-Log down to 32% middle gray and see what that looks like for our underexposed image and then we'll move up from there. Now we can't really lower our ISO anymore because we're at the base ISO for S-Log which is 800, but we can close down our iris until we get down to about 32%. But in order to confirm that we are at 32%, as we've talked about, we can use our zebra. So we'll set this down to 32. So it might be harder for you to see the zebras on the gray when our exposure is this low, but they're starting to show up around 3.2 and they're also there around 3.5. And based on our waveform, I would say that F3.5 is probably around 32%. So this is our correct exposure according to Sony. And if we look at our finished image here, we can see that it's really quite dark. And remember what I was telling you about all the blues and blacks, we can see those all over our false color. And so this is gonna produce an image that when you correct it up to the levels that you want it to be in post, yeah, maybe you'll get better dynamic range, but you're gonna get a whole lot of noise. And now let's move it up to exposed in the middle, and then we'll also overexpose it, and we'll keep track of how many stops there are in between there. So right now we're at F3.5 ISO 800. And now we'll start increasing the exposure and right away at F2 ISO 800, I would say that we've achieved it. We have our zebras right there and we have green over here. And if we look at our waveforms, yeah, we're right about in the middle there. So we have our middle exposure and that required us to go from 3.5 to F2. So that's one and two thirds stops. So just to sort of get to the same middle exposure, which has pretty decent noise performance, we have to overexpose by one and two thirds stops from the manual recommended S-Log exposure level. And now let's overexpose it, applying the same principles that we talked about before. So first of all, like I said, remember you have, to, you have to know your clipping point and then give yourself a little bit of safety room there. So the clipping point for S-Log2 is 106%, but I found that setting it to 103 plus is good for that first sort of bit of safety and then I usually go one stop down from there. So we'll set it to 103 and we'll go all the way up until we start to see zebras. And there, ISO 5000 is when they first start to come in. So we'll go down one more notch from there and that's ISO 4000. And if we check this over here on the waveforms, we can see that we're above 100 because again, S-Log2 can go up to 106. But remember that flattening of the line that I was talking about? We're not getting any of that because our image isn't really clipped. If we go up higher though, 
Do you see how now the line just gets flat? That means it's clipped. So this is the maximum that I would ETTR or expose to the right my S log because now we're two full stops above when we were exposed to the middle. We were at ISO 800, now we're at ISO 3200 and that puts us over three stops overexposed from the 32% manual recommended exposure. And that Alistair Chapman article that I was talking about, he tested one, two, and three stops over the 32% and found that by the time you get to about three stops over, you do start to lose some of that highlight detail. It does start to become, you know, flattened out a little bit. So he usually recommends aiming more for that two stops, you know, area overexposed, which for us, that would put us probably at around anywhere between, I would say, ISO 1600 and ISO 2000 in this example here. So that would look something like this to this. But we'll do a recording at both and we'll compare. Let's take a look at what the zebra levels are for that. So the equivalent level of the HLG overexposure, which we said was around two thirds to one full stop on this one over here is double that. It's like one and two thirds stops from middle and like two and a half stops from their 32%. But lastly, let's just blast through the cine gammas so we can see if there's anything to glean there, if one is better than the other for overexposure potential. So let's switch over to cine now. This is cine one, and all these are gonna be using the cine color, but it doesn't really make a difference. So now we've got our middle exposure with cine one, which puts us at F2 and ISO 250. And if we check our waveform over here, yeah, we're coming in right in the middle, so perfect. So now we'll just see how many stops we can overexpose with Cine 1 before it starts to clip. Now Cine 1 has a maximum output level of 109%. So let's go ahead and give it its full capabilities. Like I said, you probably don't want to do this. You probably want to give yourself like at least a 5% leeway there for channel clipping. But let's go ahead and do that and just see how much we can go. So we're at ISO 250. So go one, two, three, four, so five, so one and two thirds of a stop and we're clipped, we're, our whites are blown out. We go down one and we're coming in pretty hot over here on the false color and you can see the zebra starting to creep in. So I would consider this one, you know, the danger zone. So I'd probably go down one more from there and that's ISO 500. So we really only gained one stop. That's our maximum, our maximum overexposure potential on Cine 1 is only one stop. So despite it having 109% of its maximum output level, it's really only achieving the same sort of overexposure potential as HLG, but without that, without as much of that highlight squeezing. So you'll see that your white chips on Cine 1 seem really bright compared to what they were on HLG. Now, Cine 2 is pretty much exactly the same as Cine 1. It just has a lower point. Instead of 109 maximum output, it's 100% maximum output. So we'll set that to Cine 2 and everything else should be pretty much the same. We just need to bring our zebras down. One thing that you'll notice is that if you ever set your zebras in a Sony camera higher than the maximum output level of the gamma allows, they just won't work. So for instance, it's set to 107 plus, Cine 2 can't go that high. It doesn't matter how high I overexpose, the zebras will never appear. So we have to set them within the maximum clipping point, which is why it's important to know what the maximum output level of that given gamma is. So let's go ahead and set them to, we'll set it to 95, just like we do with HLG. 100 is where they go, but 95 will give us that 5% buffer zone there. And so let's bring this down. So that's one third, two thirds, and we're already introducing some clipping at 95. And then by one full stop over, we're blown out. So if you want more overexposure potential, Cine 1 has probably a full half stop better than Cine 2 does. So now we'll switch to Cine 3. So we'll increase our zebras up to the maximum output level. See they disappear at 109, so that's obviously out of the Cine 3 realm. So we'll go down to 108 and then the zebras are there so we know that we're working. And we'll just bring these down. And so they start to come in around ISO 1000, so 800 would be the maximum that we could go. Now that is a bit higher than what we could get from Cine 1, but let's make sure that our middle gray is the same. So let's go up to here and set this to 45, and then we'll jump this down until it starts to appear. And yeah, it looks the same, but our image is darker. At ISO 250, it's darker than it was at Cine 1 and Cine 2, and that's part of Cine 3. It's supposed to, you know, work with the shadows a little bit more. So right now, if we increase exposure from here, based on the same lower limit, we can go one third, two thirds, a full stop, one and one third, one and two thirds, and then two full stops when we come in. So Cine 3 is actually giving us more latitude than Cine 1 and Cine 2 was. So based on this purpose, if this is your intention, 
Cine 3 will probably give you a better image overall. But there is one thing to consider. Cine 3 is darker. So again, don't fall into that trap where you try to boost the shadows because that's just going to add the noise back and you're going to end up with the same result as if you'd shot in Cine 1 in the first place. Cine 3 will give you quicker, better noise if you shoot this way though, if that's something that's important to you. Now lastly, we'll look at Cine 4, which again is the same idea, but even more extreme than Cine 3's version. So let's go ahead and change this to Cine 4. And first off, let's find our middle gray. So we'll come down here. And it's the same again, 250 is the same. So our middle gray is the same for all of them. It's just, you know, how dark our shadows are getting and how much headroom we have. So now we'll go, first of all, let's overexpose so that we can see what level our zebras will work at. So we'll go here, 108 works, 109 works. So interesting how Cine 3 doesn't have the 109 potential, but Cine 1 and Cine 4 do. So now we'll set it to 109, and let's put this down to, we'll go back to 250, and then we'll walk ourselves up from there. So 1 third, 2 thirds, full stop, 1 and 1 thirds, 1 and 2 thirds, 2 stops, 2 and a third, Two and a half is no good, so two and a third. So this obviously suggests that Cine 4 has the best potential of the Cine Gammas for that noise reduction aspect, if that's what's important to you. Because you have the most overexposure potential, even though you do get a pretty extreme contrast with Cine 4, so that's something to keep in mind. So now let's load all of these up in Resolve and examine the differences. Actually, before we do that, let's take a quick look at the Movie Gamma, just for fun, in case any of you shoot that way. And by the way, the Movie Gamma is the same gamma as if you set the picture profile to off. When you're in photo mode, off is the same as a still gamma, and when you're in movie mode, off is the same as the movie gamma. So let's set it to that, and we'll go through the exact same procedure here. So we'll find our middle gray, which, perfect, so it's still the 45% zebras on Sony still seems to be working for this purpose. And then we'll just see how much overexposure latitude we have. Look at the contrast on this thing. So we'll set it to, we'll do 95 plus, just to be safe. And... <laughs> I haven't even changed the exposure and 95 plus is already showing as overexposed So there's nowhere to go with this So all that tells us is that if you want to use movie gamma you better make sure that you nail the exposure It's the easiest one. It's pretty much completely finished as soon as you record it So there's no post work involved, but exposure is crucial and that's going to be a common thread here The ones that require the most work in post give you the most latitude to be able to monkey with your noise or pull your highlights back in and the ones that require the least amount of work in post generally require the best efforts when it comes to exposure because like I said, this is funny. I have to actually underexpose a notch just to stop the highlights from clipping, which now puts my middle gray below the middle point. All right, so I've got the clips loaded up here in Resolve and now that we're done shooting, I can turn off that lantern so that the right side of my face isn't overexposed to the point of losing detail. Anyway, so in here we've got them all set up. The first three clips here are HLG. We go under, middle, over, and then we've got S-Log. We've got under, middle, slightly over, a lot over, and then we have that Cine 4. You can see the Cine 4 right away, it's so contrasty. So let's start with the middle exposure HLG, and we'll set this one up to be our control, and then we'll make all of them match that. And this is easy to do because we're using a color checker, so we can just position our bars where they belong on our waveform. So this is gonna be the exact same principles we did when shooting, but now we're just gonna finesse it a little bit in post. So if we go ahead and we look here at the waveform in the bottom corner, we can see that our middle gray is exactly where we want it to be, right on that middle line, which is represented by this 512 here. And our white is pretty good. It's, it's a little bit down, and that's what you get with log. It kind of pushes the whites down a little bit. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to increase the gain until our white bar reaches around that 90% point, which is about here. This is a 90% white, so that's where we want it. And then we'll see that our uh, middle is a little bit higher now because we increased the gain, so we'll just lower the gamma off. And we'll just sort of finesse these up and down, gain up and gamma down, until we get them to where they each belong where they do. This one around 90% and this one around halfway. And then we'll just look at the image and see what the contrast is like and see if we're happy with it. And at this point we can make a change with the lift if we wanted to you know, bring the shadows up or down. Now like I said, bringing the shadows up is gonna be problematic for noise. So usually if you exposed well, it would only be down or nothing. And where we are right now, I would say it looks pretty good. This absolute black area here is coming in right around where we want it, which is in that sort of like six to 10% zone. And so I would say this image looks fine, and this will be sort of our baseline that we'll get the other ones to match. So now let's jump over to the underexposed image, and we're going to have to boost this one up to match that. But we have the same guide to do it, we're just going to hit those same points. So let's start by increasing our gain until we get to that 
90 percent point. And now here you can start to see that channel separation thing that I was talking about. If we switch to the parade, you can see that the red is actually higher than the green, which is higher than the blue. So when we go back to our waveform, we've got different color separations in those bars, which is why it's possible to clip one channel and not the others, which is why you want to leave yourself a little bit of a buffer there. Here we find that our gamma is still too low, even though like our midtones aren't hitting that halfway point, even though our gain's all the way up. And this is where we're going to start to get into noise town, and where we're also going to shift our colors in an unwanted way. So let's increase our gamma until we get that to about the halfway point, and then we can, you know, bring our gain maybe back down a little bit, gamma up a little bit, just again, balance them out. And then now you can see that we have a lot more noise down here because our, our black area is sitting up a little bit higher, but look at all this junk around here. So we're going to lower the lift a little bit to bury some of that noise and match the overall look. So we can come down a bit more. Do you see how it's just less impactful now? The, the colors just seem more washed out. That's another thing that happens when you have to lift everything up. And then if we look at that noise, this noise here is what I was talking about when I said that if you underexpose your HLG, you get a much dirtier image. So let's play this one for a second. You can see that the noise is quite aggressive here. And if we switch to the one that's exposed in the middle, you can't hardly see it at all. Now let's go to our overexposed image and bring that down and see if we notice even more improvement. Now you can see here that we're already at that 90% point for our white, so we're not going to have to increase our gain, which is going to be great for removing noise because we don't have to increase anything, we can just lower things. And our gamma is going to come down because our midtones are quite high. So let's bring our gamma down until it gets to about halfway, and then we'll just, we'll increase our gain a little bit just to make sure that we don't lose that sort of like intensity of the white. Uh, but other than that, I would say we're pretty good already. And you can see now how thin this bottom line area is. That's where our noise is going to be hiding. So if you look at the thickness of that and compare it to the thickness of this one, it's a little bit thicker. And then compared to the thickness of this one, it takes up like <laughs> the bottom 10% of the image. So now let's just compare the noise between all three. I would say that you're definitely making a big step going to the middle exposure over underexposed, and then you just get a small advantage going to the overexposed. So let's compare the underexposed S-Log to the underexposed HLG, where on the underexposed S-Log, yeah, it's definitely noisy and it's thicker than the overexposed one, but it's not near as bad as HLG. So now let's go up to the ISO 2000 version, which was like two and change stops over the recommended 32%, and it is a little bit cleaner. But just like we experienced with HLG, the difference between middle exposure and slightly overexposed isn't as huge as underexposed and middle exposure. All right, now lastly, let's take a look at the Cine 1 just to see what's going on here. Now don't be alarmed, I know it looks like it's clipped over here, but that's because we were exposed above 100%, but we can bring that down with our gain, and then as you can see, everything comes back to normal. So we'll set that down to around the 90% zone, and take our gamma down, just like we did with all the ones, the exact same technique. And that is very, very, very clean. Let's compare that to our overexposed S-Log. Similar, yeah, I mean, the Cine 4 is probably a little bit cleaner. I mean, it's gotta be because of what it's doing in the bottoms there. So let's wrap up. In my previous videos, I suggested that HLG is a great choice for a well-balanced profile, and it certainly is. But anything that's well-balanced usually isn't the strongest in any one area, and in the case of HLG, it performs horribly when underexposed. So if you plan on taking advantage of HLG, make sure you aim for that two-thirds of a stop to one stop overexposure to keep your images clean. If, however, you plan on finessing your images a little bit in post and don't mind the extra work, then S-Log2 definitely has the best potential for lowest noise because it has the highest tolerance for overexposure. Just make sure you're not overdoing it because as we saw here there's definitely diminishing returns when it comes to noise reduction via overexposure and you're probably better off bringing it back down a notch or two in order to preserve those finer highlight details so I've set up so I've set so I've set up so I've so I've set up a control shot so I can but that's going to be it for me I hope you found this video entertaining or at least helpful and if you did make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already but if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining then what are you still doing here I would have ducked out a long time ago all right I'm done